biology students, Mr. Holloway here. In today's video, we're going to talk about some of the important evidence that supports the theory of evolution by natural selection. As good scientists, we should always seek evidence before accepting any explanation as plausible or true. Theories, as we use the term in science, are broad scientific explanations that help us to understand a wide variety of related phenomena and are supported by a solid base of evidence. The theory of evolution by natural selection is no different. We accept it as a plausible and true explanation because there is a huge amount of evidence that supports this explanatory theory. Evolution as a theory is actually one of the most exhaustively tested theories in science, and we still accept this theory as true today because it has withstood generations of failed attempts at disproval. In order to help us understand the evidence that supports the theory of evolution, it is important to understand that this process takes time, often huge amounts of time. Complex structures like eyes and four-chambered hearts and internal skeletons don't simply appear out of nowhere, out of the blue one day. It takes many, many generations of descent with modification for these structures to evolve. But the Earth is very, very old, 4.6 billion years old to be precise, and there has in fact been ample time for evolutionary processes to form complex structures like eyes, hearts, skeletons, and more. To understand just exactly how long that is, let's take a look at Earth's history as if it had all occurred within one 24-hour day. If the Earth was formed at midnight, 12 a.m., then the first living cells appear in the fossil record at about 5.30 a.m., and at 8 a.m., photosynthesis starts filling our atmosphere with oxygen. The first eukaryotic cells with nuclei and other membrane-bound organelles appear at about 12.48 p.m. in the afternoon. We're already over halfway through our day, and all we've got so far are prokaryotic cells, photosynthesis, and eukaryotic cells. At about 5.36 p.m., multicellular animals appear, and at 9.10 p.m., we see the first organisms with a dorsal nerve cord, the first chordates. At 9.28 p.m., the first land plants moved out of the sea and onto the continents, and at 10.05 p.m., the first tetrapods, organisms with four legs and an internal skeleton, start to walk around in the seas and then on land. We see the first dinosaurs at 10.45 p.m., the first mammals at 10.58 p.m., and the first flowering plants at 11.20 p.m. At 11.39 p.m., the dinosaurs go extinct, and at 11.58 and 56 seconds, one minute and four seconds before midnight, the first anatomically modern humans appear in the fossil record. So, if the entire history of the Earth was only one 24-hour day, then the entirety of human history, from nomadic hunting and gathering to cave paintings and the invention of written language, from the invention of agriculture to the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, from the age of exploration to the Industrial Revolution, two world wars, the space race, everything right up until today, all of that would have occurred in the last one minute and four seconds before midnight. And if all of our glorious historical achievements fit into that tiny amount of time, imagine just how farther back the history of the Earth really goes. These numbers, of course, are not exact. They are up for interpretation and up for debate. They change as we find new evidence and figure out how to more effectively interpret the evidence we already have. The origin of multicellular organisms is a good example. We have ample evidence to suggest that they were definitely multicellular animals 600 million years ago, but there is also a small amount of evidence suggesting that the origin of multicellularity dates back as far as 2 billion years. But what is certain is that the Earth is incredibly old, and human history is merely the blink of an eye in comparison to the age of the Earth. We know that there were no living cells on Earth in the beginning, and that there were definitely living cells after the first billion years went by. It took another billion years or so to evolve the first eukaryotic cells. Cells are the basic structure and function in living organisms, and it took more than 2 billion years just to evolve these basic structures. We divide Earth's history into units of different sizes. Eons are the largest unit, and there have been four eons in Earth's history. The first eon, the Hadean, was lifeless. The first prokaryotic cells appeared in the second eon, the Archaean, and the first eukaryotic cells appeared in the third eon, the Proterozoic. All three of these eons are referred to as pre-Cambrian time. The fourth eon of Earth's history, which began only 542 million years ago, after about 4 billion years of time had already passed on our planet, 
is divided into three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Each of these eras is also broken up into periods, which we can see in this column here. The Cambrian period was the first period of the Paleozoic era, and it is a significant time because of something called the Cambrian Explosion, a period of relatively rapid evolutionary diversification that lasted about 60 million years. After spending 4 billion years working up to simple multicellular creatures, evolution produced an enormous variety of complex animals because all of the basic cellular structures had already been well established. Many of the lineages that evolved during the Cambrian explosion still exist today, the chordates and the arthropods, for example, although specific varieties have long since gone extinct. The coal that we burn in power plants today, the coal that produces so much of the electricity that we enjoy in our daily lives, began to form back in the Carboniferous, 300 to 260 million years ago. And that's how long it takes for coal to form. The Carboniferous was characterized by very dense tropical forests of trees that are extinct today. These dense forests, when they went extinct, were buried and over hundreds of millions of years were compressed and broken down into what we now call coal. Coal is mostly carbon, and that carbon came out of the atmosphere. That huge transfer of carbon from the atmosphere to vegetation and then into the ground where it was buried is why we call this period the Carboniferous. At the end of the Permian, about 250 million years ago, Earth suffered the largest mass extinction ever to rock our planet. 90% of all marine life and 50% of all terrestrial life went extinct during the Permian extinction. But evolution managed to rebuild this biodiversity of our planet as the survivors were able to thrive in their new environment and evolved to fill new niches that were empty due to the extinction. This evolutionary period following the Permian extinction produced the dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, another mass extinction rocked our planet and wiped out most of the dinosaurs, except for the birds, of course, who survived and thrived. The mammals also survived, and with the big dinosaurs out of the way, the mammals evolved to fill the holes. Eventually, this would lead to the evolution of our lineage, the hominids, who evolved in the Neogene period. The genus Homo, our genus, evolved just before the beginning of the Quaternary period, roughly two million years ago, and the first anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, arose about a hundred thousand years ago. Given enough time, incredibly complex structures and functions can evolve. To understand how a complex structure like the eye could evolve, we have to understand that a structure this complex could never evolve overnight or in just a few generations. A fossil is any preserved remains of a dead organism. It could be a footprint from an extinct animal, the imprint of a plant leaf in a rock, a bone that has been mineralized and turned to stone over time, or even an insect preserved in amber. Fossils are records of the past, and the deeper we look in the ground, the further back in time we go. This is the law of superposition, and we know this to be the case because new rock is always laid down on top of old rock, whether it is sediment gathering on the bottom of a lake, as we see here in this diagram of how a dinosaur becomes fossilized, or whether it's lava from a volcanic eruption running across the surface of the ground. In all cases, this new rock pushes the existing rock deeper and deeper into the ground over time. In the fossil record, we have an admittedly incomplete record of organisms that have lived in the past. This record is incomplete because not every organism that dies is preserved as a fossil, and we certainly can never know if we found all the fossils that were ever formed. But the more fossils that we find, the better our record becomes. In the fossil record, we can see transitions in form that occur over the course of many generations. Sometimes these transitions are gradual, as we see here, and sometimes they appear rapid. Sometimes they are rapid transitions, but remember, the fossil record is incomplete, and we may be fooled by the fact that large spans of time are missing and went unpreserved for one reason or another. But, despite its incompleteness, the fossil record does provide us with a general timeline and order of events in evolutionary history. This is why we suspect that the first cells appeared 3.5 billion years ago, because that's how far we have to go back in the fossil record to find these cells. Does that mean that there aren't older cells that we simply haven't found yet? Could be, but science is not afraid to update itself when new evidence becomes available.
We've put together our story of the Cambrian explosion based largely on the fossil record, and a rare fossil formation called the Burgess Shale found in British Columbia, Canada. This rare fossil formation preserved many soft body parts that normally aren't preserved in rock, and these fossils, dated to about 500 to 600 million years old, reveal a tremendous adaptive radiation in form and function, and many of the modern groups of animals were established in that period of evolution. Not things like bears and bats, those come way later, but things like chordates and arthropods. In these images, we can see some of the interesting and sometimes bizarre forms that evolved during this period in Earth's history. Like this one, called Hallucigenia, because it seemed so weird to scientists who discovered it that they thought they must be hallucinating. Other familiar organisms, like the trilobites and sponges, were present during this period as well, as were the first chordates, something similar to this tiny creature called Picaea. The fossil record also helps us to see how the first animals moved out of the sea and onto land, as we can see in this series of photos of fossils, depicting various stages in the evolution of legs from bony fins. These fossils tell us that the first tetrapods evolved in water, as do the footprints we've found in shallow seabeds to suggest that this is where walking first occurred. Over time, this appendage that began as a bony fin became more complex because these variations provided advantages to the early tetrapods who possessed them. Eventually, this structure, as well as the primitive lung which continued to evolve as well, provided another benefit, access to new habitats on land. This would provide freedom from predators, as well as new sources of food, and organisms that were able to move around above water would have a tremendous advantage. The fossil record also helps us to understand the relationship between birds and their dinosaur ancestors. Similarities in bone structure suggest that birds share a common ancestor with dinosaurs like the Velociraptor. Over the past two decades, numerous fossils of dinosaurs with feathers have been recorded and identified, and fossils like the famous Archaeopteryx fossil help us to pinpoint when in history the first bird-like wings evolved. The fossil record also helps us to see where the whales and dolphins came from. Mammals evolved on land. The fossil record shows us this too. But certain mammals, the whales and the dolphins, moved back into the sea. The fossil record shows us how this transition occurred slowly over generations. The fossil record also helps us to understand why modern whales have the remnants of hip bones when they do not in fact have any back legs. Why would a whale have hips unless it had inherited these hips from an ancestor who also had hips in order to walk around on land? The fossil record has helped us to figure out that story. The ancestors of whales did live on land, but found advantages to hunting along the shoreline. Those individuals who had limbs that helped them to swim would have an advantage on the shore. And if they were able to swim out a little deeper, or stay underwater a little longer, they would have further advantages. Over time, this lineage moved back into the sea, and once in the sea, back legs and thick fur turned out to be a disadvantage. This led to the loss of the back legs and thick fur due to natural selection in favor of individuals with smaller back legs and a finer fur coat. In some lineages, size also turned out to be an advantage because bigger individuals were less likely to be preyed upon in the ocean. Today, the blue whales are the largest animals on Earth, and they have no predators as adults because they are so big. But some fossils of whale ancestors are even bigger. The fossil record even helps us to understand our own origins. Although we are still finding new specimens all the time, our current set of hominid fossils suggests that the split between our lineage and the evolutionary line that led to chimps occurred about five to six million years ago or so. It also helps us to see how our lineage evolved to walk upright, evolved a huge and complex brain, and used our brains as we learned to use and make tools that provided us with further advantages. The fossil record even shows us how early Homo sapiens lived alongside another species of Homo for a while, the Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis. The Neanderthals are not our ancestors, but our extinct cousins, far closer to us than the chimps who are our closest living relatives today. But the fossil record isn't the only evidence that supports the theory of evolution. Good thing, too, because the fossil record, like we said, is still largely incomplete. The bones and structures present in modern, living organisms are just as informative as the fossil record in this regard. For example, when we were talking about tetrapod evolution in the fossil record a few minutes back, we were talking about the evolution of the common ancestor of all organisms with four limbs. 
Modern tetrapods, from crocodiles and birds to whales, horses, bats, and humans, all inherited our four-limbed body plan from our shared common ancestor. And as a result, there are fundamental similarities in our bone arrangements and structure. The bones in these four limbs are color-coded to indicate fundamental similarities of structure and organization. As you can see, the forelimb of the crocodile is closest to that of the ancestral tetrapod, the form from which all others arose. Structures that have a common origin, but not necessarily a common function today, are known as homologous structures. Homologous structures are evidence of evolution because they support the idea that organisms who possess these structures inherited these structures from their shared common ancestor. That's evolution. But of course, there are many different uses for an arm or a leg. And even though these arms and legs we see depicted here are all the same in terms of their basic skeletal structure, different selective pressures cause different groups to evolve differently and to adopt different functions depending on what natural variations turned out to be useful. But whether these limbs are used for flying, running, swimming, or grasping, their basic structures, the bones and their arrangement, were inherited from the same common ancestor. So even if birds, bats, and pterosaurs evolved their wings independently, these wings are all just relatively minor variations on the same basic plan for a forelimb. Vestigial structures are also evidence of evolution because they show us the evolutionary heritage of an organism. The pelvic or hip bones in a whale are such an example. Whales don't need a pelvis today because they don't have any back legs, but still, they have a pelvis. This shows an evolutionary heritage that involves shared ancestry with organisms who did have back legs, organisms that walked on land. Embryology, or the study of patterns of embryo development, provides yet more evidence of evolution and shared ancestry between organisms. Development is fundamental to life. Developing from a fertilized egg or zygote into a multicellular organism with a defined top, bottom, front, and back, with paired limbs and bones and organs positioned in just the right place. This is a very complicated process, guided by many, many genes being expressed at just the right time. So the fact that all vertebrates go through a period of development as embryos that is incredibly similar is evidence of evolution because it indicates that this complicated pattern of development was inherited by all vertebrates from the shared common ancestor of all vertebrates. This diagram here is a classic image drawn by German scientist Ernst Haeckel. It depicts the early embryo development of fish, of salamanders, of tortoises, chickens, pigs, cows, rabbits, and humans. As young embryos, we all look strikingly similar. We all have gills, we all have tails, and we also all have a dorsal nerve cord and notochord. And these are the four characteristics that define all chordates. But, as we continue to develop, our appearance begins to differ more and more. Some of us lose our tails and gills, while others keep these structures. Common ancestry explains these similarities. We inherited our gills, tails, nerve cord, and notochord from our shared common ancestor, even if some of us lose these features during fetal development. Here are some photos of real vertebrate embryos side by side with Haeckel's original illustrations. Not bad, considering these illustrations were created in the mid to late 1800s. But there may be no better evidence for evolution than the universal genetic code of life. If all vertebrates have a bony spine because they inherited it from their shared common ancestor, and if all mammals have hair because they inherited that trait from their shared common ancestor, and likewise if all tetrapods have four limbs because they inherited these limbs from their shared common ancestor, then what does it tell us that all organisms of all varieties have DNA that instructs their cells how to construct proteins? This code which is summarized for us here in this chart that tells us which amino acids go with which mRNA codons, is the same for all life forms inhabiting planet Earth. Pretty strong evidence for a common ancestry of all life. Genetic similarities are evidence of evolution because, like traits, genes are inherited, and similar genetic sequences indicate a shared common ancestor. For example, humans and chimps share DNA that is about 99% similar. Because our genes hold a code that instructs our cells how to build proteins, we can look at the proteins built by the cells of different organisms in order to determine evolutionary relationships. 
If organisms share a recent common ancestor, we would expect that their proteins would be very similar in their amino acid sequences. Because these two groups would have each inherited the genetic sequences that determine these amino acid sequences from their shared common ancestor. But mutations in DNA would cause differences to creep into these sequences over time. And the more time that goes by, the more differences we would expect to accumulate. The further back in history two groups share a common ancestor, the more differences we would expect to find in the amino acid sequences that make up their proteins. If we look at the hemoglobin proteins produced by different members of the animal kingdom, comparing the amino acid sequences that make up hemoglobin to those of humans, we find that rhesus monkeys have hemoglobin that is 95% similar to that of humans. 95% of the amino acids are exactly the same, meaning that about 95% of the DNA that codes for this sequence of amino acids is also the same. 87% of the amino acids in hemoglobin from mice are the same as those in humans, 69% for chickens, 54% for frogs, and only 14% for lamprey. This phylogeny depicts the evolutionary relationships between these six groups of organisms based on these amino acid sequences. We find this same relationship when analyzing other genetic sequences shared by these groups of organisms as well. These patterns are evidence of evolution because they show us that all these organisms share a common ancestor, because they all share at least some of the same key genetic sequences, sequences which were inherited by all these lineages from that shared common ancestor. The fact that we've been studying evolution long enough to actually recognize when we are seeing it is evidence of a sort as well, in the same way that seeing things fall when you drop them is evidence of gravity. Take our salamanders in California, for example, who are adapting to their environments in the coastal mountains and the Sierra Nevadas differently, despite sharing a common ancestor. These salamanders are deep in the process of speciation, because different variations are favored in these different ecosystems, and these populations are becoming increasingly isolated reproductively as their gene pools diverge. Bacteria evolve even faster because they reproduce so much faster. The evolution of antibiotic resistance in several disease-causing lineages of bacteria is a huge cause for concern in medicine, and it is all based on the same principle of natural selection. Some bacteria have natural variations that make them more resistant to antibiotics, and these bacteria survive when treated with a limited course of drugs. These bacteria then reproduce, and their descendants inherit their predecessor's resistance. In just a few decades, we've seen significant increases in the number of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, indications that the gene pools of these bacteria are changing to contain more of the resistant genes, as the less resistant genes are selected out of the population when they are exposed to antibiotics. That's evolution, and in this case it happens fast enough that we can actually watch it happen. And we've got a pretty good record of evolution happening within the history of modern humans. In mammals, who consume their mother's milk when they are very young, it is customary to lose the ability to digest milk sugars after infancy. Most mammals simply don't drink milk as adults because they don't have the ability to process the sugars in the milk. In humans living in Central Europe, a mutation in the gene pool caused a condition known as lactase persistence, in which the genes that code for the enzyme lactase, the enzyme necessary for digesting milk sugars, remains active after infancy and into adulthood. This mutation turned out to be advantageous because people who had it were able to take advantage of a food source that others were not, dairy from cows, sheep, and goats. The domestication of these animals began in the Fertile Crescent about 11,000 years ago and spread to Europe over the next few thousand years. With more food and nutrition available to people with the lactase persistence mutation, this mutation became more common in the population because the people who had it were more likely to live long enough to reproduce and pass this mutation on to their children. Our best evidence suggests that this mutation appeared about 7,500 years ago in Central Europe, and we found evidence that by about 7,000 years ago, people living in the area were already making and eating cheese, which suggests that they were in fact able to digest dairy products at this point. Interestingly, a second group of humans also evolved this ability, but because of a totally different random mutation. 
This second mutation occurred in Africa about 3,000 years ago and is genetically distinct from the mutation that caused lactase persistence in the populations of Europe. Today, we can look at the genes of modern humans and determine whether they inherited their lactase persistence, if they have this condition, from the European gene pool or from the African gene pool. The fact that this condition is now common in the descendants of certain prehistoric human populations is evidence of evolution because it shows how certain alleles that confer survival advantages can become more common in a gene pool due to natural selection. And that's really what evolution is all about. The evidence that supports the theory of evolution comes in many different flavors, and we are finding more evidence every day. This evidence suggests a shared common ancestry among the living creatures on planet Earth and helps us to understand how evolution affected life on Earth before we were around to catalog these events. It is interesting to note that in Darwin's day, nobody had any idea what a gene was or what DNA was. But even without that knowledge, Darwin's theory has withstood the test of time. In fact, the more we learn about DNA and genetics, the more this knowledge supports and enhances our understanding of biological evolution. Today, Genes and genetic similarities are possibly the most important evidence of common ancestry that we have. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, and remember, you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need until you feel like you understand the evidence that supports this very important theory in biology.